So I may just give a brief introduction for those that are here so that we can sort of respect people's time, and I'm hoping that we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, so again, I wanted to thank Dr. Rowe for being here. He's currently an associate professor of radiology and radiological sciences at Johns Hopkins. Um, he's an expert in PET imaging, specifically genital urinary PET imaging, um, both PET and SPECT, um, particularly PSMA-targeted PET um, um, scanning for prostate cancer and real cell carcinoma. And he helped establish utilization of sesame spec um, to look at non-invasive uh, non um, renal medicine. Uh, Steve and I have worked together um, a lot when I was at Hopkins. Uh, honestly, Steve, you're one of my favorite people. I've never had you talk and not learned at least three things. So I'm really looking forward to having you speak tonight. And thanks for being here for the group. Thank, thanks so much, Ash. No, I, I, I feel the same way. And uh, I think I only have maybe two things that you can learn tonight, but uh, but I'll, I'll see if I can squeeze a, a third one in there. But uh, yeah, no, it's always always been a pleasure working with you. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for uh, for, for joining tonight. I'm gonna, uh, I'm actually gonna break up this talk into a couple of different sections. Uh, there's a lot we already know about PSMA PET and some really important things, sensitivity, specificity in different contexts. Um, how the how these radio tracers perform in selecting patients for things like uh, oligometastatic uh, uh, metastasis directed therapy, but there are also a lot of things we don't know about PSMA PET. Uh, things like uh, imaging biomarkers for figuring out who's going to respond to PSMA targeted endoradiotherapy, uh, what role AI is going to play, whether advanced imaging. Uh, techniques uh, such as advanced quantitation or radiomics, whether those play any role in, in what we know about PSMA PET. And so I, uh, I hope to uh, cover a little bit about what we know about PSMA PET uh, and then sort of launch into maybe some of those ideas that are more sort of emerging in the, in the realm of PSMA PET and hopefully what we'll begin to address over the next few years as uh, particularly AI comes to sort of predominate in radiology. So with uh, with all that being said, uh, I do have a few disclosures. Probably the only one that's really of any importance here is that uh, I, I have some relationships with Progenix Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. They're a uh, subsidiary of Lantheus and uh, Progenix initially and then Lantheus licensed uh, one of the PSMA radio tracers, uh, F18 DCF PYL or PYL or now Polarify or F18 Piflufolostat. I'm not a huge fan of any of the, the modern names, uh, but uh, 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 some, a, a fair bit of the data I'll show you is, is with that particular radio tracer. So I do wanna sort of emphasize that disclosure. Uh, I uh, should also note that uh, uh, maybe the uh, only interesting factoid about me is that uh, in around 2013, I injected the first ever dose of that agent into, into a human subject. It was a gentleman with uh, a locally aggressive uh, recurrent prostate cancer, and uh, so so that 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 may be my uh, my ultimate claim to fame is that uh, one of the PSMA agents that we use uh, um, first went in, first sort of went under human skin at uh, at my hands, and the patient did great. So. All right, let's, uh, we'll, we'll start very briefly with a, a little bit about PSMA. It's a transmembrane carboxypeptidase. It's highly expressed on prostate cancer cells. It, uh, it does have heterogeneity of expression. So while about 95% of prostate cancer tumors have PSMA expression, that PSMA expression isn't universal among the epithelial cells in those tumors. So you'll, uh, if you stain them by immunohistochemistry, you'll see some tumor cells that have tons of PSMA on their surface and other tumor cells that don't seem to have much PSMA expression. So at the, at the cellular level, it is relatively heterogeneous, but at the tumoral level, uh, the vast, vast majority of patients, at least at initial uh, initial diagnosis will have PSMA expression. And at least at the histopathologic level, there seems to be a correlation between expression levels and tumor aggressiveness. I don't know that we always recapitulate that at the scan level. Uh, there hasn't been a study yet that's definitively shown that there are, uh, that there's any sort of correlation between um, a uh, PSMA uh, standardized uptake value and uh, a Gleason score or grade group, so uh, so we don't uh, we don't necessarily always find that at sort of the macroscopic level, but at least at the microscopic level, there there is this association between uh, aggressiveness and PSMA expression. 
It was just a cartoon of PSMA. Uh, it's, a, again, a transmembrane carboxypeptidase. It has a large extracellular domain, which has a number of sites on it that we can leverage for imaging and therapy with both small molecules and, and antibodies. The small molecules that have been developed today tend to bind to the active site of the enzyme, and they do so with very high affinity, uh, down to sort of picomolar affinity levels, and they're almost irreversible inhibitors of the enzyme. We know a few things about PSMA PET so far, and I think we know these things relatively definitively. Uh, and with, with at least very rigorously done phase two trials, and a couple of the things we'll talk about uh, have been, I think, validated with pivotal phase three clinical trials to the point that uh, there's no real question about them anymore. But we know that there is moderate sensitivity and very high specificity for preoperative nodal staging. We know that there is high efficiency for sites of biochemical recurrence. And we think that PSMA PET is effective for guiding focal therapy for patients that have an oligometastatic phenotype. And I think we also know that PSMA, PSMA PET is effective for selecting patients for PSMA targeted endoradiotherapy, which currently in the US would be Pluvicto. And let's uh, let's look at each of those things that at least we uh, we believe we know about PSMA PET so far. <clears throat> if we look at patients with high risk prostate cancer at initial staging, the vast majority of them will look like the patient on the left. They'll have focal high uptake in their dominant tumor lesion in their prostate, and generally not have anything outside of the prostate. So. Uh, a sizable minority of these patients, perhaps 15% or so, will have visible adenopathy outside of the outside of the prostate. But it's relatively rare that a patient presents like the patient on the right, who has unsuspected systemic metastatic disease. This was a patient who was clinically localized by CT and bone scan. Uh, but when we imaged him with PSMA PET, he not only had high uptake in his prostate, he had evidence of pelvic adenopathy, as well as retroperitoneal and left supraclavicular adenopathy. And none, of those, none of those lesions were biopsied. This patient was actually on a blinded protocol at the time. Uh, he underwent a radical prostatectomy, had an immediate biochemical failure, uh, and has uh, subsequently required systemic therapy. The data I, uh, or the images at least that I just showed you, uh, were the backbone of uh, sort of the trial design for uh, one of the cohorts in the Osprey trial, which is the first uh, pivotal clinical trial that eventually led to S FDA approval of DCFPYL. Osprey was actually a two cohort trial, but we'll sort of focus on one of those cohorts. Uh, and one of those cohorts, uh, originally 268 patients underwent uh, polarified PET of whom 252 were valuable uh, by local histopathology. And the co-primary endpoints in that, in that particular cohort of Osprey were sensitivity and specificity for pelvic lymph node dissection uh, relative to a histopathologic gold standard. The vast majority of patients in that cohort did have high uptake in their prostate, but uh, that wasn't of particular interest to the FDA because these patients had already been biopsied and shown to have high or very high risk prostate cancer. So the, the real sort of, or where the rubber hit the road was how the agent performed in detection in detecting uh, pelvic lymph node involvement, again, relative to the histopathologic gold standard. Osprey cohort B consist of, consisted of men with um, evidence of recurrent or metastatic disease on conventional imaging, generally CT and bone scan. The uh, idea was that if those men also had PSMA uptake in those lesions, they would undergo biopsy and that PSMA PET would, uh, that we'd be able to get an idea of the sensitivity and the positive predictive value of uptake in lesions, again, against the histopathologic gold standard. <clears throat> Ultimately, the FDA decided that that cohort was also not of interest because they had, uh, uh, because those patients had findings on conventional imaging, the FDA didn't feel that they needed sort of the uh, added information from molecular imaging to, to help guide their therapy. I, I think that in retrospect, that was relatively short-sighted. Uh, I would love to know the sensitivity and positive predictive value in the metastatic setting so that we can effectively guide metastasis-directed therapy or perhaps open other therapeutic options for patients. Uh, but the FDA's perspective was, if you can see it on CT or bone scan, you don't need to see it with, with PSMA PET. So we'll focus on Osprey cohort A, which is, again, high-risk or very high-risk pre-prostatectomy patients 
uh, and our co-primary endpoints are sensitivity and specificity against a histopathological standard. <clears throat> the uh, sensitivity was actually surprisingly low in the study. I think we all thought the agent would perform a bit better than it did. And based on primarily single center prospective and retrospective trials, the uh, expected sensitivity for the agent relative to that histopathological standard was about 60 percent, with the lower with the lower bound of the 95 percent confidence interval being around 40 percent. It turns out the sensitivity was actually right at that lower bound. It was around 40 percent. And, but the specificity was exceedingly high. It approached a perfect specificity with about a 98% specificity. Now, in a post hoc analysis of only those patients who had pelvic lymph nodes greater than or equal to five millimeters in short axis, if you excluded everyone else, the sensitivity went up to 60% and the specificity remained unchanged. Now, that's a little bit of statist statistical trickery, and I don't mean to imply that this agent met both of its co-primary endpoints that only met the specificity co-primary endpoint. But what I take away from the, these data as someone who interprets images of these um, sort of pre-definitive therapy patients is that no matter what the sensitivity is, the specificity is robust. So I can read these scans incredibly sensitively and I should read them incredibly sensitively. <clears throat> if there's any hint of uptake in the lymph node, proximal external iliac vessels, along the proximal external iliac vessels, <clears throat> excuse me, in the obturator fossae, internal iliac vessels, uh, perirectal, presacral, and if anything in those areas along the iliac vasculature, I should really come down hard on that being evidence of in one disease and nodal involvement in these patients. Because no matter how sensitively I'm reading the scan, my specificity should be robust to that. And generally speaking, the pathologist is going to find evidence of disease in those lymph nodes. So th that's my takeaway from, from Osprey cohort A. Um, and you know, I, I, I can't get around the fact that the sensitivity is relatively disappointing, uh, but there are now multiple sort of pivotal phase three trials with both Polarify and Gallium PSMA 11 that have all kind of settled on that as a sensitivity, right around 40%. <clears throat> so patients with, uh, with who are being primarily staged, the staging is still driven by surgery and ultimately surgery is going to determine what their end stage is if they go to surgery. Uh, but, uh, but we really should as imaging interpreters be trying to read these scans very, very sensitively in locations that would make sense for early disseminated disease and prostate cancer. Let's uh, let's move maybe one step down the uh, down the road of patients who uh, who have prostate cancer from initial staging to those patients who have evidence of biochemical recurrence based on a rising PSA. Uh, one one question I often receive from from folks is, do you have a PSA cutoff for bio, for suspected biochemical recurrence patients below which you won't scan them? We, we don't in our PET center. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll scan any patient where the clinician has a concern that the patient may be undergoing a recurrence. The, uh, as we'll discuss, the detection efficiency of the scan certainly tracks with PSA level, uh, but uh, anyone who is suspected of having a recurrence, there's a fair chance that we'll either localize the site of disease within an area that they may be eligible for salvage therapy, or we'll identify findings that make them ineligible for at least what we think about as traditional salvage therapy. Let me show you a couple of examples of, of uh, biochemically recurrent patients. This is a patient who had a CT and bone scan that were read as negative. They underwent a polarified PET. As you can see, uh, there was this sort of relatively subtle area of uptake posterior to the bladder. And what I uh, what I tell my, uh, my trainees and other folks that I read with is, uh, you really have to window uh, very aggressively. You have to really widen out the window on your on your PSMA PET to try to find these areas of local recurrence that are either posterior to the bladder or right down around that uh, area of the anastomosis of the bladder neck with the urethra. Uh, local recurrences love to hide there, and with excreted radio tracer in the bladder, it can be really hard to sort of uh, find those subtle recurrent lesions. Uh, on that background of excreted uh, radioactive urine. In fact, uh, this was this was an early example of uh, of our experience with PSMA PET, and 
the uh, clinician who had ordered the scan, or I should say referred the patient to this clinical trial, didn't believe us. So they went ahead and got a uh, dynamic contrast enhanced um, multi-parametric MRI of the pelvis, uh, which showed an enhancing lesion at exactly the same site as the PET did, uh, which sort of cinched down the diagnosis of a local recurrence in, in this patient. Even more common than local recurrences, we'll, we'll see one or perhaps two or three uh, radiotrics or avid lymph nodes in the pelvis. Uh, I would say this is the most common pattern we see in patients with biochemical recurrence. The, uh, uh, the real pitfall here is that the peristalsis ureters are going to have radioactive urine in them as well. And so one has to be very diligent about making sure they follow the ureters as best they can anatomically, making sure they're not overcalling a potential lymph, uh, lymph node recurrence as uh, that's actually just uh, urine in the in the ureter. So there's not necessarily a great universal way to deal with this. Some centers will give Lasix to patients, kind of flush all of this uh, radioactive urine out to the best they can. Uh, other other centers will do multi uh, multi time point imaging to hope that whatever is peristalsis in a given time point won't be there when they look again, perhaps 30 minutes later. But uh, all those things require a great deal of flexibility in what you're doing in your pet center. And uh, most pet centers nowadays, it is wall-to-wall -wall patients. So it is very, very highly choreographed as when patients are getting injected, when they're going on the scanner. And it's hard to have kind of the flexibility to go back and image the pelvis again or uh, give Lasix and have your... Uh, your patient who's already undergone a prostatectomy it may have a little bit of incontinence trying to hold their urine in and not, uh, uh, you know, not uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, get urine all over your, your pet table and make it even harder to read the scan. So, uh, so we essentially don't do any of those things. We image the patients an hour post-injection starting at the mid-thighs going up to the vertex of the skull and we see what we see and we hope that, uh, that we're able to find these relatively subtle lymph node lesions. Uh, our initial experience in, in the biochemical recurrence setting informed what became the Condor trial, which consisted initial, uh, eventually of 208 men who underwent a uh, polarified PET on the basis of a rising PSA that met either AUA criteria or Phoenix criteria for biochemical recurrence. What's interesting about the Condor trial is that these men had to have uninformative standard of care baseline imaging. So CT, bone scan, uh, Aximan PET, C11 choline PET, whatever available at the given center that they were being imaged at. If they underwent that imaging and they had a definitive finding consistent with prostate cancer, they did not qualify for the Condor trial. So the Condor trial is truly sort of an additive value above and beyond what we can get with what was previously standard of care baseline imaging. <clears throat> The uh, primary endpoint of the Condor trial was something called the correct localization rate, which was pretty agreed upon with the FDA that uh, men who had a finding on their polarified PET would then go sort of down a standard of truth pathway. And that standard of truth pathway had to co-localize the same lesion as was on the polarified PET according to a uh, sort of anointed um, standard of truth panel or a truth panel uh, that, that has uh, perhaps connotations that can't be backed up by what we're actually able to provide, but, uh, but they were called the truth panel. And the uh, standard of truth was hierarchical and it was a sort of a tiered process. So in those patients uh, who could undergo a feasible and safe biopsy of their apparent site of recurrence, if histopathology was available from that biopsy, then that was the highest level of the standard of truth. In our clinical practice, that tended to be men who um, had had previous radiation and had an apparent in-gland recurrence. And then our friendly neighborhood uh, urologist, uh, which at the time would have included uh, uh, Ash and other folks, uh, could then go in and sort of biopsy the, the apparent recurrence within the, uh, um, within the, uh, the previously radiated gland. If pathology wasn't available, that patients can undergo some sort of informative follow-up imaging. In many patients who had had previous CT and bone scan as sort of their baseline imaging, this consisted of either aximan PET in uh, soft tissue lesions such as lymph nodes or potentially a tumor protocol MRI if there was a bone lesion that appeared to be a site of recurrence. <clears throat> 
If neither pathology nor imaging were available, the patients could get um, focused radiation to visible sites of PSMA uptake without starting uh, systemic therapy. And if they had an objective biochemical response to that radiation therapy, that was also considered to have met the standard of truth. It wound up only one patient was in that last pathway, and all of the other patients that had findings on their polarify scan were in the fir first two pathways. Uh, a couple of sort of, uh, uh, I think, in, in, important take home messages from the, the Condor trial data. The overall detection efficiency was about 70% in, in this cohort. The correct localization rate had been predetermined by the FDA at 20%. If, uh, if the correct localization rate was over 20%, then the scan would be deemed to provide value, and, uh, and the FDA viewed that as sort of an approvable threshold. Uh, here's the correct localization rate data. As you can see, everything blew way past that 20%. 20% threshold, which perhaps in retrospect was relatively conservative, but there's not a uh, there's not a very steep trend with correct localization rate versus PSA levels. So at PSA levels less than 0.5, the correct localization rate is robust. At PSA levels greater than five, the PS the correct localization rate is also robust. But if you look at the detection efficiency relative to the PSA level, it's a much more stark trend. So at PSA is less than 0.5. More than half of the scans were negative in those patients. In PSAs greater than five, almost 100% of the scans were positive. Again, what I take away from this data as, as an imaging folk, as an imaging person, is that um, I can expect a fair number of scans at low PSA levels to be negative, uh, and I should be okay with that. I shouldn't sort of make stuff up. I shouldn't start calling inguinal lymph nodes positive or things like that. If the scan is negative, it's negative, and I should make my peace with that. But if the scan is positive, say an obturator fossil lymph node with high PSMA uptake, then regardless of the PSA level, I should feel confident in that finding. If the PSA level is 0.3, I know my correct localization rate is going to be robust. If it's 3, I know my correct localization rate is going to be robust. And so the same finding on a scan in a patient regardless of their PSA level, uh, we should feel fairly confident in calling that. Now, when things start to get fairly distant from local recurrences or pelvic lymph node involvement, then we should start to maybe look a little bit askance at those findings. For instance, a solitary rib lesion that has a relatively benign morphology on CT, uh, I'm going to blow that off 99 times out of 100. If the patient has a PSA that's uh, relatively low, it wouldn't imply that they would have uh, that they would have uh, a risk for for a, a distant bone metastasis. If we, uh, if we accept, as the NCCN would suggest we should, that PSMA PET is the de facto most sensitive imaging agent that we have for patients undergoing either primary staging or evaluation for biochemical recurrence, then the next step would be those patients who have a parent oligometastatic disease on the scan, we should be able to <clears throat> sort of guide our uh, metastasis-directed therapy on the basis of what we see on PSMA PET, at least much more reliably than we could with, say, CT or bone scan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's a patient who, uh, uh, who had a uh, rising PSA. It was 3.9 at the time of the scan. He had a single apparent sort of perirectal or presacral lymph node recurrence and nothing else on his scan. This patient underwent uh, 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 SBRT to just this lesion did not start systemic therapy. <clears throat> and on his follow-up scan, that, that lesion went away, it mobilized, and his PSA became undetectable. Uh, we followed this patient for a couple of years, and his PSA remained undetectable. I don't know that I would ever think that a patient with oligorecurrent or oligometastatic disease is necessarily cured of their disease, but there may be a subset that at least have a long-term progression-free survival or biochemical recurrence-free survival who may very much benefit from metastasis-directed therapy and are spared the toxicities of systemic therapy. At the other end of the spectrum, we have patients that appear to be oligometastatic on the basis of conventional imaging. This is a patient who had a normal CT scan, uh, had a bunch of traumatic and degenerative findings on his bone scan, and had one suspected metastasis 
in a right-sided rib uh, that wasn't easily explained by trauma or degenerative change. When he underwent a PSMA PET, though, he had hundreds of marrow-based lesions. Uh, and this made sense. He had a PSA over, of over 100. I, I think it would have been uh, faulty to believe that this patient was oligometastatic with a PSA that high. But that was, uh, that was ostensibly why we were imaging this patient. Uh, this does happen. It doesn't happen very often. I would say I've only seen maybe a handful of scans that are like this, where a patient has all of these marrow-based lesions that are occult on CT and bone scan. But obviously, for a patient like this, uh, this is sort of a life-changing event where uh, something like metastasis-directed therapy is going to be pulled off of the table, and they're definitive, definitively going to get systemic therapy. So very important that we do identify these patients, although they are common. And then here's perhaps a patient that's in the middle of those two patients. He has more than just pelvic adenopathy, as retroperitoneal adenopathy, but doesn't appear to have disseminated disease. His PSA at the time of imaging was 10.9. He underwent SBRT to the retroperitoneum and the pelvis. And when he came back a few months later, his PSA had continued to go up. It was 19.8 at the time of repeat imaging. And he had a number of, of bone lesions that were not visible on the baseline scan. So I am sure that there were at least a few cells at each of those locations that we just weren't able to, to pick up with the scan. Uh, and so this patient uh, failed metastasis directed therapy. I think it's really important that we start to parse these patients out. And things like uh, AI or other quantitative imaging biomarkers, I think will start to help us do this. It's probably not a question just of tumor volume or even tumor distribution. There are probably more subtle things that dictate uh, which patients are going to respond to metastasis-directed therapy and which patients won't. And it's probably a combination of imaging data as well as clinical data. Their PSA level, their PSA doubling time, their frailty indices, all these other things. I think we'll be able to bring all of those into uh, AI algorithms eventually and really prognosticate on who's going to do well with metastasis-directed therapy. If we take the sort of final step down this pathway and look at what we know about patients with advanced metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, <clears throat> we know that these patients can be effectively treated with lutetium-labeled PSMA-targeted therapies. Lutetium is a relatively low-energy beta emitter. It's not as high energy as something like iodine, so you can get fairly whopping doses of it. A standard clinical dose would be about 200 millicuries, and the patient doesn't need to be kept overnight in the hospital or anything like that. They can be released out to the general public. Uh, and generally speaking, they won't have much in the way of toxicities from an agent like this. If we look at those patients that have an objective biochemical response to the tissue PSMA therapy, it's probably somewhere around 40% of patients and maybe 70% of patients overall will have some kind of PSA response. Of course, that also means that patients uh, with PSMA avid disease on their PET scan 30% of those patients are going to blow right through this therapy for reasons we don't necessarily understand. There doesn't necessarily seem to be a lot in the imaging that's going to tell us which patients are going to respond or not. But as we start to incorporate things like radiogenomics into the equation, I think we'll be able to identify those patients that aren't going to respond to this kind of therapy. Again, the response to these kinds of therapies are generally at the cost of relatively low toxicities. So if we look at nephropathy at any grade, it's maybe 12 or 14% of patients will have some kind of nephropathy. But these are generally grade one or two. They're self-limited. Their, their renal function will recover fairly quickly. And for the most part, the kidneys are pretty radio resistant, and we're not doing anything. We're not harming patients by, uh, in terms of their kidney function by treating them with these agents. Uh, xerostomia, uh, I would say that clinically, I probably see this more than anything else in the patients that we're treating with Luvicta right now. And uh, it is probably in the sort of 25% range that's, that's reflected on the slide here. Generally happens after a couple of doses of therapy, so it's not really after the first dose, maybe after the second or third dose. Quite honestly, patients usually complain of uh, uh, not necessarily dry mouth, but a little bit of pain associated with the uh, with the salivary glands. Uh, again, this is self-limited. Patients take a, uh, a couple of sour candies, and they feel a whole lot better afterwards. And, uh, and then uh, later on in therapy, it's something that doesn't seem to come back up. So I think we, uh, uh, you know, the... Uh, uh, 
If you look at the alpha labeled agents, like actinium labeled agents, xerostomia is horrifying. Patients become permanently xerostomic. They'll sometimes lose all their teeth. They walk around with water bottles because they don't produce saliva anymore. Those, uh, those kinds of toxicities aren't seen with the lutetium agents, uh, at least not in, in my experience or according to the data. And of course, we now have the vision trial, which really definitively showed that lutetium PSMA 617, or again, Pluvicto in the US, <coughs> is uh, superior to, uh, in common, or I should say, in combination with standard of care therapy, is superior to standard of care therapy alone in terms of progression-free survival, overall survival, and freedom from skeletal events. So I kind of ran the table against standard of care. That's perhaps not surprising. The other trial that's often quoted with vision is the therapy trial from Australia. It found that relative to a cabazitaxel randomization, uh, the biochemical response rate was better with Pluvicto. The quality of life and toxicities are better with Pluvicto, but there wasn't an overall survival advantage. Uh, the inclusion criteria were a little different with the therapy, and I'm happy to sort of discuss that in more detail, uh, but I won't dive too deeply into it now. But at least in the U.S., we really hew closely to the vision criteria uh, for deciding which patients should get treated with Fluvicto, and uh, these are the data that we quote those patients when we see them in clinic. All right, so I think that's what we know about PSMA PET so far, which are really some profoundly practice-changing things, and we should, uh, I think, sort of almost view prostate cancer as sort of a pre-PSMA era and a post-PSMA era in terms of how we treat patients. But there are a number of things that we don't really know about PSMA PET yet, and these are things that will hopefully emerge over the next few years. I think the trials are ongoing that that will provide us uh, the information that uh, uh, that will answer these questions, but we don't have that information yet. And there may be some things that remain hard for us to hard for us to to figure out definitively. Uh, one thing is, it's not all about sensitivity and specificity. It's much more important that we figure out what the predictive biomarkers are from the imaging. Uh, it's all well and good to find where sites of disease are, but if patients are going to fail when we try to act on the sites of disease, that that isn't helpful to the patients, and it certainly doesn't reflect well on us. We need to know who's going to respond well to different kinds of therapy. We need an improved understanding of lesion quantification. You can imagine if we're using something like a PSA cutoff to decide who's going to get Pluvicto. If we image them on one day with PSMA PET and they meet that cutoff, and then we image them on another day with that PS with PSMA PET and they don't meet that cutoff, it's relatively arbitrary who we're treating and who we're not. So we need the scan to be very repeatable, and we need to figure out what the uh, parameters are within the scan that are going to inform um, how well we can select patients. And then ultimately, all of radiology is headed towards artificial intelligence paradigms. Uh, these are already important for things like uh, managing our, our workflows, lining up patients appropriately on the scanner, things like that. But we really need to go beyond that to, again, identify those quantitative predictive biomarkers of how patients are going to do with different kinds of therapy. So uh, as far as image quantitation goes, we absolutely need reliable quantitation. We need to understand the aspects that impact quantitation are needed for response assessment and measuring the repeatability of quantitative metrics. So uh, a long time ago, we, we looked at just what organs are repeatable. It turns out the liver is very repeatable uh, from a, a PSMA perspective. So if we're going to use an organ to sort of benchmark our tumors against, the liver makes a lot of sense. Uh, indeed, the vision trial used liver uptake as sort of a metric for selecting patients for uh, whether they would go on to Pluvicto therapy. And it turns out that's actually an intelligent thing to do. If you try to use other organs, they're just much more variable in the degree of uptake. One question that comes up a lot is what, uh, what effect sort of uh, adhering radio tracer to the tumor does to normal organ uptake. If you have more and more tumor, do the normal organs uh, have less radio tracer in them? And does that mean that you can give gigantic doses up front and it'll all go to tumor and kind of spare the normal organs and spare potential toxicity to those normal organs? I would say that for most patients uh, with relatively normal uh, um, tumor burdens, uh, you don't really see much of a tumor sink effect. 
other things uh, actually will play more of a role in sort of the variability of the normal organs over time. Now, this is a controversial point, and when you get to patients that have extremely widespread disease, like a super scan on their PSMA, and it looks like a sodium fluoride PET, those patients will have a tumor sink effect, and that's fairly well worked out in the literature. Those are also patients you can't treat with Pluvicto because they've already got marrow compromised, and when you give them a beta emitter, it wipes out whatever marrow they have left. So I don't know what good it does you to know that, but for patients that have either modest to relatively high levels of uh, tumor, uh, tumor burden, you won't see much of a tumor sink effect. All right, I'm gonna blast past a couple of points just in the interest of time. But uh, one, one thing that is, uh, has really sort of, I guess, gained a, lot of, uh, uh, gained a lot of steam in the radiology literature is the idea of radiomics and advanced quantitative parameters that are going to be predictive or at least associated with patient outcomes. So um, the only way we can really know the repeatability of those metrics and how reliable they are for our decision making is to do uh, things called test retest trials where we image a patient and then at a fairly short time course image them again with the same agent under the same conditions with no new or no change in their systemic therapy regimen. And for the most part, these patients uh, do have visually very repeatable, um, very repeatable uptake in their tumors. Whether they're limited volume disease, relatively high volume disease, uh, other than things like where the bowel happens to be peristalsing or whether there's peristal peristalsic excreted radiotracer and ureter, it is hard to tell the scans apart. Uh, but every now and then you see something that may be a little bit more, uh, more conspicuous on one scan versus another. I won't necessarily go into all the, the details on this because I imagine it's kind of a, a tremendous amount of clinical interest. But what, uh, what we found out by doing a relatively extensive test retest study in a relatively large number of patients with a large number of lesions is that the repeatability actually improves as you go to higher and higher SUVs, at least as a percentage of the SUV. So this means that those, those patients with widespread castration-resistant metastatic disease who have very high uptake in their tumors, so long as their tumor burden isn't sort of overwhelming our ability to treat them, uh, we know with a high degree of certainty that the quantitative metrics that we're deriving from their PET scan are going to be very repeatable. But that falls apart a little bit with radiomics. So if you look in the literature, there are hundreds and hundreds of papers on the use of radiomics in PET, that this is sort of a next frontier, perhaps a stepping stone towards, um, towards the true advanced metrics available with, uh, with artificial intelligence. Um, and radiomics is really just a fancy way of saying, we're taking one pixel on an image and we're finding out its relationships to other pixels on the same image, and that those relationships are more meaningful than what we may see uh, just looking at the image with our, with our eye. Turns out that the vast majority of radiomic metrics in PET are completely unreproducible and likely of no real value. Uh, and this is, uh, again, I, I, I don't want to dig too much into the weeds here, uh, but uh, uh, in pet reconstruction, high frequency features are sort of not estimable, and we just sort of fill in the blanks in the in the reconstruction matrix. So the uh, so anything that relies on sort of a high frequency feature, an edge between a tumor and non tumor, or uh, you know very very fine higher order mathematical relationships between pixels, it's never going to be repeatable. And we know this on a physics level. That hasn't stopped people from publishing hundreds and hundreds of papers describing these features on PET. But it turns out they're just really not repeatable. More broad tumor level, low frequency features such as entropy or homogeneity, those features are relatively reproducible. And hopefully there'll be some sort of quantitative metrics that come out of those. But again, the vast majority of radionic features, unfortunately, just don't hold any water with PET. If uh, we take the next step, though, from radiomics to AI, 
uh, you know, does this mean your friendly neighborhood radiologists and nuclear medicine physicians are out of jobs? Uh, I, I, I hope not. I, I think that our jobs are hopefully complex enough that if AI is starting to replace our jobs, it's probably replaced a lot of other jobs uh, out in the community. And, you know, we're probably in some sort of Terminator 2 Judgment Day scenario. So I, I don't really worry about my job disappearing overnight. I think what it's going to do in the short term is sort of level up the, the radiologist. We're going to be able to do things like lesion classification, whole body tumor assessments, prognostication and decision making that were that are impossible based on just the imaging findings or the imaging findings we can see with our eye, but we'll be able to sort of derive metrics that in combination with clinical parameters are going to tell us how a patient should be treated and provide prognostic information for how they're going to do with that treatment. Quite honestly, AI is already at the point where it can probably detect things on the scan, at least as well as I can. Uh, now, it doesn't necessarily do a great job of figuring out if those things are false positive or true positive, but we're getting to that point and it's not going to be too much longer before AI just has so much data and these algorithms are so advanced that, uh, that they are going to start doing those things. <clears throat> One thing we've done to sort of try to better classify lesions is provide a, uh, a scale of our certainty as to uh, how uh, how much we believe a given lesion is uh, is prostate cancer versus not prostate cancer. Uh, and this includes things that maybe PSMA added that are other types of cancer. It may include benign lesions. Um, it's a five-point record scale, much like uh, PIRADS or various other RADS systems. Uh, of course, we called it PSMA RADS because what else would we have called it? Uh, and the upper end of the scale is, are, are things that are uh, fairly definitive for prostate cancer. Uh, the scale is, is reproducible across various experience ranges uh, of the interpreting physician. Uh, I always like to point out that, uh, that one of our readers uh, labeled here as IR1 uh, kind of fouled everything up. So, uh, you know, I should uh, probably punch him in the nose next time I see him. Uh, but overall, uh, there do, there's really not a lot of experience needed for, for this kind of system to be applied. And what we hope to eventually do with this is, uh, is be able to automate an entire workflow where scan is acquired, uh, there's a convolutional neural network that pulls out abnormal areas of uptake on the scan, it classifies those areas of abnormal uptake, and it tells us what our next step is. Is this prostate cancer? Is it not prostate cancer? Is it a benign lesion? Is it a potentially another type of cancer that, uh, that we have to go and biopsy to find out, is this just an abnormal presentation of prostate cancer, or does this patient have lung cancer, or renal cell carcinoma, or various other types of cancer? So I think that's a, uh, that's, it's a lofty goal. This kind of nuanced decision making isn't really where AI is right now. AI is a much more of a binary sort of point where it tells you something is or isn't. Uh, but the next step for AI is to make it a little stronger, a little bit more, I don't want to say consciousness-based, but nuance-based, where uh, where it's going to start parsing these things out where we can do real decision-making based on what it believes, at least in combination with what an expert radiologist might believe. Uh, just a, a quick aside is that uh, uh, unfortunately, there are still indeterminate findings. We tried to account for that in this PSMA RAD system. And we do a much better job with soft tissue lesions than with bone lesions. Bone lesions are tough with PSMA PET. A lot of them are things like fibrous dysplasia, particularly in the ribs and low PSA patients. I honestly discount those, those kinds of lesions now, knowing that there's probably a one in a thousand chance I'm going to get bit by discounting those lesions. But we do a pretty good job with equivocal findings in lymph nodes. And somewhere around 75% of things that are read as equivocal on a baseline scan will turn out to be cancer on a subsequent follow-up scan, whereas only about 20% of the things in bone that are read as equivocal ever turn out to be cancer on the follow-up scan. So, so again, we do a much better job with, with those soft tissue lesions than we do with bone lesions. This is admittedly relatively uh, a relatively small patient cohort and a relatively small number of lesions, uh, but there truly are indeterminate findings. One of uh, one of the things I hope AI is going to do, and I apologize, you can probably hear the sirens behind me. 
I, I'm in Baltimore, so uh, cost of doing business, I guess. But uh, but one of the things I hope AI is able to do is eventually get rid of these indeterminate findings and just allow us to be more definitive about whether something is benign or malignant. There are other advanced reconstruction uh, algorithms and quantitative approaches we can take. So if we use something called a point spread function reconstruction, which tends to increase both the the signal to noise, but also the noise of a uh, of a PET scan, we can sometimes bring out things that may be a little bit indeterminate uh, and make them more definitive. But again, at the cost of higher intrinsic noise in the uh, uh, in the final images. So. Depending on your, your sort of local practice, some radiologists are able to, to sort of read through this pretty easily. Some may struggle a little bit with exactly what to do with, uh, with those PSF reconstructions and how seriously to take lesions that are found on them. And then something I like to show just kind of uh, probably for shock value more than anything else is that uh, we're also in an era where we can take uh, data that's acquired in sort of a uh, spiral or volumetric fashion and we can uh, provide sort of photorealistic uh, representations of that data and this is all uh, this is honestly based on on technology that folks like Pixar developed for computer graphics for animation but you can uh, provide realistic shadowing effects you can really accurately recapitulate sort of a three-dimensional view of things and with that, uh, you can find where there's abnormal uptake. Now, it took a really smart German computer scientist to figure out how to create sort of this internal lighting effect where things on PET uh, appear in these, in these uh, visualizations as, uh, as though they have internal sort of light emission. Even if these things don't provide as much in the way of diagnostic certainty, I think you can imagine that uh, sitting down with a patient uh, at, in your office and uh, turning your workstation monitor around and saying, here's where your disease is, here's where it isn't. Uh, these kinds of images are very intuitive and very understandable for, uh, for our patients. And so I think there's at least a patient education advantage to these kinds of visualizations. All right, so uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll sort of speed things up a little bit, maybe kind of blow through a, a couple of points here just so uh, I, uh, make sure I leave time for, for any questions that there might be. Uh, again, I think one of the important things that uh, that we have to dredge out of the scans isn't so much sensitivity and specificity, it's prognostication. So a, a really nice study that was done between the Netherlands and Australia showed that if you take men with intermediate high-risk prostate cancer, if they had a true positive scan that was recapitulated on histology, versus a false negative scan in which the patients did have disease in their pelvic lymph nodes and histology, the patients that were true positive did worse than the patients that were false negative. So if, you, uh, if your patient gets a scan and, uh, uh, and they don't have any pelvic lymph node involvement, you take up the surgery and you find they do have pelvic lymph node involvement, that negative scan was a positive prognostic indicator for how they're going to do. I, I think this kind of information is really important, and I hope to see more studies like this in coming years. If we uh, if we take our oligometastatic patients and look at whether all of their PSMA avid disease is treated versus not treated, those patients who have PSMA avid disease that doesn't get treated on an oligometastatic paradigm, those patients have worse progression-free survival and worse distant metastasis-free survival than patients who have all of their PSMA avid disease uh, effectively treated by metastasis-directed therapy. This is from prospective data, but it is a post-hoc analysis, and that prospective data wasn't powered to actually demonstrate these findings. And then we can ask, you know, how do patients do with systemic therapy? There was early data to suggest if you gave a patient something that affected the androgen axis, that that would drive PSMA expression, make all their lesions easier to see, help you find new lesions, and would be a great way to approach our patients who might get metastasis-directed therapy. Or you can also imagine, give a patient a, a shot of ADT, and then you go on to give them Pluvicto, because now their disease is going to be more avid than it was before. It turns out it's much more complicated than this. And if we uh, take a look at, say, patients that are starting Abby and Enza, and we image them at baseline, and then after starting those systemic therapies, they have lesions that do all sorts of things. 
Some will get hotter, some will get colder, some will be more apparent, some will be less apparent. But that change in how their apparent PSMA tumor volume uh, is reflected in the baseline versus the follow-up scan does have prognostic uh, prognostic significance. So uh, these are just a couple of equations we sort of came up with ad hoc that uh, we thought might make a little bit of sense. These are by no means uh, particularly validated. And again, I think AI is going to do a much better job of finding these kinds of imaging biomarkers. Uh, quick waterfall plot. But the, the real thing is that if we look at chain, if we look at things like time to therapy change that's stratified by those kinds of equations, we find that patients who have sort of an overall increase in their TSMA expression after starting systemic therapy do worse than those patients who have an apparent overall decrease in their PSMA expression. And this is even recapitulated in overall survival. Uh, just real, real briefly, uh, we only have overall survival data because this data was so horrendously awful to try to parse out that it took us about four years to do so. Uh, and so every time one of my trainees tells me, you know, Dr. Rowe, why are you never getting around to this paper? I always tell them I'm actually just waiting for the data to mature so we can have a higher impact paper. Uh, some of them believe that, some of them don't. Uh, but sometimes it does take a little while for data to, to mature. If you just stratify patients by their beginning tumor tumor uh, tumor burden, uh, that tumor burden is not predictive of how they're going to do in terms of time to therapy change or overall survival. So there really is something buried in the change in PSMA expression from the baseline to the follow-up scan. We're going to need a lot bigger trials to figure out what that is, and we're going to need AI to help us figure out the best biomarkers to try to parse out of that. Uh, let me briefly show you a story that's perhaps a little bit simpler. These are patients on bipolar androgen therapy that were imaged at baseline and then at two months after starting therapy. Again, their individual lesions do all sorts of things under these androgen axis targeted, uh, targeted therapies. But if they developed a new lesion on their follow-up scan, those patients progressed earlier uh, by conventional imaging, and they progressed in the sites that were picked up by the PSMA scan. So there's no doubt in my mind that PSMA harbors imaging biomarkers that will eventually be recapitulated at CT and bone scan, but the PSMA uh, biomarkers do so at an earlier point in treatment than our traditional imaging does. And then, of course, uh, PSMA, uh, PSMA can be used in a number of other cancers, and I think that uh, I think that industry is finally starting to get around to the idea that there's only so many prostate cancer patients. If they if they want to continue to make money, uh, granted there's an endless number of prostate cancer patients uh, and potential indications of prostate cancer, but there may be other types of cancer that can benefit from this kind of imaging. Uh, clear cell RCC is, is definitely one of those types of imaging, and I hope to see more definitive trials come out in the near future. You can really find very subtle things you can find brain mats because of their blood brain barrier breakdown and the radio tracer getting across the blood brain barrier because of that breakdown. Uh, it's definitively better than FDG in my mind, uh, which isn't great in renal cell carcinoma, although it's not bad. But RCC is, or PSMA is better in clear cell RCC. And it's not just a sensitivity issue, it's a specificity issue. This is a patient who uh, was imaged with PSMA PET. Uh, unfortunately, passed away shortly thereafter, but was enrolled on a um, on a rapid autopsy protocol, and so we were able to get histology on a number of lesions that would have been difficult to biopsy, and they all turned out to be uh, true positive for renal cell carcinoma. And uh, because PSMA PET is generally binding to endothelium in these non-prostate cancers as opposed to epithelium, we can think about things like uh, neovascular targeted agents like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, PSMA may be a readout for how patients are going to do with those uh, with those neovascular targeted agents, and may also be an early readout of how they're responding to those agents. No one's really proven this yet. It's been kicked around in the literature. I certainly hope that eventually we figure this out. And with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up very briefly. Multiple indications for diagnostic PSMA-based PET imaging we're just at the cusp of starting to understand PSMA targeted PET findings as imaging biomarkers. And uh, as you may have heard and me say a number of times, I'm a huge believer in AI. It's going to play a role in biomarker development. 
but we're really at a point in sort of the weak, uh, weak AI uh, spectrum. We can give AI tasks to accomplish, but it is not it is not an independent consciousness. It doesn't have a lot of nuance to what it's doing, uh, and and there's still a role for for all of us to sort of inform how AI is going to perform uh, in the setting. I want to thank a whole bunch of people. I, I want to thank you for your attention. And if we have a couple minutes left, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Steve. That was that was great. Um, it, any questions from the, well, I, I have a question and I'll, I'll field it from the groups. So, you know, I, I really like the, 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 the pet imaging rads, like systematic scoring, you know, how, what, how is that? I missed a little bit of how that's going to get disseminated and, and maybe is it going to be taken by ACR, et cetera? No, uh, no, thanks for that question, Ash. So we're, uh, uh, a ACR seemed to have like a bit of a hiccup in, in, uh, in what it was doing during COVID. So we actually submitted this system to ACR, uh, or American College of Radiology, uh, maybe about three or four years ago. Never heard back from them, tried to shake the tree a bunch of times, just never heard back from them. And then maybe about three months ago, get this email out of the blue. Hey, we're interested in this idea. Uh, can you provide us some more data and if things have evolved? Uh, in the three years since, or three or four years since you originally submitted this, so we just put back in our uh, our sort of uh, answer to all their questions and queries, and we're hoping that the ACR will will adopt this as one of their uh, at this point numerous RAD systems. Uh, you know, it uh, my my experience with it at, at even our local level is that uh, they're like like anything. There's a bit of a learning curve. I don't think it's as steep a learning curve as you might see with something like PyRADS, uh, or uh, there's probably not a lot of breast imagers on, on the call here, but uh, the uh, BiRADS uh, breast cancer system is now like a 450 page manual. I find that just utterly useless. How can anyone know all of the lexicon that's in that kind of that kind of document? So we're, we're working really hard to try to keep it very simple, uh, just keep it to that five point scale provide a little bit of decision-making guidance. And I'm hoping the ACR will sort of glom onto that and agree with us that there's some value in the idea that molecular imaging needs to have these kinds of, of systems as well. Uh, there, uh, there have been other folks that have looked into this. So I see occasional presentations at things like the European College of Radiology or RSNA and groups unaffiliated with us that are that are working to validate this. And so I hope that continues and, and we can build up the the level of data that uh, that convinces everyone that there's at least some role for sort of a, a systematic approach to the scans. So I have a question. Um, this is Maha Hussein. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for a um, great lecture. Um, I have a question about uh, two things, the false positives, yeah. uh, but yet it is picking up cancer. So I had uh, two or three cases. Uh, I believe two were lung cancer and one was actually plasma cytoma. I mean, in, in, if anything, I'm glad it got picked up. This The patient with the plasma cytoma had uh, a uh, basically pedicle of one of his uh, spine vertebra that lit up and it sounded on the um, uh, scan or the MRI portion of it was lytic lesion. So I had him be biopsied. So my question is, uh, in the context of false, essentially it's false positive, but it's not false. It picked up cancer. The other part is um, I've had cases, uh, several cases actually, because uh, I'm still, you know, I use the imaging as a tool, not as a decider. So I generally, if it's, things don't make sense, I follow up with another scan. Uh, and in this case, a couple of cases, more than a couple of cases, what was positive after waiting two months went away. So uh, my question is, yeah, my question is, what is your thoughts on those? Thank you. Yeah. So absolutely no great great questions and the uh, you know I think the 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 real sort of I guess decision tree in the false positives or whether it's something that needs uh, that sort of we can decide it's a false positive on the basis of a, a relatively benign morphology on the CT portion of the PET CT or whether we re really need to chase it down I think in the early days we chased a lot of things that were benign rib lesions and I'd feel comfortable calling benign and not doing additional imaging or any additional work upon now. Uh, but in the early days, we didn't really know. Um, and now that the data has matured a little bit, we know that those things uh, do tend to uh, 
due to the never manifest as cancer, if it's an isolated bone lesion, and say a patient with relatively uh, low PSA recurrence or a primary staging patient. But uh, but I have a relatively low threshold for sending patients to biopsy if their lesion doesn't seem to make sense with prostate cancer. So as you mentioned, something that's a purely lytic lesion, I'm going to be really concerned that that's something other than prostate cancer. You know, could it be, uh, uh, you know, plasma cytoma would be one possibility, or do they have an RCC that I missed because of all the uptake in the kidneys, or, uh, you know, or a, a cancer that's outside of the field of view. Uh, the lungs are perhaps particularly where where this manifests a lot, where um, if I see, you know, knowing that uh, that there are folks at Hopkins specifically interested in the patients who have a uh, a uh, a lung only biochemical recurrence, and that those patients may have some interesting sort of genetic phenotype or interesting genomics behind why they recurred in the lung. If I see something isolated in the lung that's PSMA avid, I'm absolutely asking for for a histopathologic verification of what that is, because in my mind. It could be prostate cancer, but that's pretty unusual, and uh, and it could be lung cancer, and that, that would seem to have really important implications for how the patient's going to be treated. So, yeah, if it doesn't make sense with prostate cancer, again, I have a le- low threshold for, for trying to biopsy it, uh, but I, I do think that uh, that in terms of the outside reads that I see, I think there's still in the field a lot of uh, a lot of uncertainty and potential overcalling of things that are that that we can get around on the CT. If it's something in a rib that's kind of expansile, ground glassy, is almost certainly like a fibr- fibrous dysplasia or something benign. I, I think we have to be comfortable sort of blowing that off. And uh, but but I don't see that on a lot of outside reads. There's still a lot of folks that at least raise the possibility that that's a metastasis, and then sort of force our clinical colleagues' hands to go and biopsy it or get a tumor protocol MRI or something else that may not provide a definitive answer. So just, I'm sorry, just a quick question yeah. though. Is there anybody that's doing work on what tissues in the body that will actually express a PSMA beyond the prostate? Because the fact, as I said, the cases I've had expressed it and it was real cancer. It just did not turn out to be prostate cancer. So when we think yeah. of PSMA, we're thinking prostate specific, but it really is, I mean, right, it's right. Right. yeah. No, exactly. Unfortunately, we're stuck. Oh, that's a <laughs> yeah, or misnomer. Yeah. So okay. um, Thank you. there's there's very little in the way of I think systematic approach to that. You know, uh, there tend to be uh, a million case reports in the literature of things that people saw that were avid on PSMA PET, and then they got histology that was a prostate cancer, and it's like, well, it's a case report. We'll throw it out there in the literature. But uh, and so. Uh, lymphoma, I think, is a great example of that. There's a few case reports on PSMA avid lymphomas. I've seen a couple of PSMA avid lymphomas, but I have no idea how often lymphoma is PSMA avid because no one's really kind of doing those systematic prospective studies. I, I do get the sense that uh, that because uh, because PSMA is becoming cr- such a crowded space that the companies that have intellectual property in this area are becoming interested in this. And I think over the next few years, there will be those systematic approaches, but I, I don't think they exist right now. Thank you so much. Absolutely. No, great questions. Thank you. And uh, let's see. There. Oh, there is, uh, let's see. It looks like there's something in the chat. Uh, and it, uh, 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 so do you think AI and quantitation of overall tumor burden coupled with dosimetry data that we will uh, uh, progress to individualized RLT dosing? Um, you know, I, I'm, of, I'm of two minds about that question. I think it's a great question. I think it's something our field is going to struggle with for a while. I, uh, I, I'm a believer that, that we should be trying to figure out if, uh, if the, particularly in sort of high disease burden patients, if there's enough of a tumor sink effect up front, can we give someone just an unbelievably whopping dose up front? then hopefully sort of limp them through their recovery of their marrow and uh, and perhaps give them either lower doses or you know stop dosing them at some point in the not too distant future, kind of let them recover and hopefully have them have a positive response to therapy. I am a believer in that. But whenever I talk to folks in, in Europe who are doing a lot of dosimetry and don't sort of have the 
regulatory constraints and the insurance constraints that we have in the US. They say, oh yeah, we do dosimetry on lots of patients. And I say, well, do you, do you alter your doses based on that? And they, they always say no. So I'm not sure why they're doing dosimetry or what we should be doing as far as individualizing the doses. It is certainly a very appealing concept and I, I do hope it eventually gains some traction. And particularly as, uh, as we get to an era where a lot of patients are going to be post, uh, post lutetium and post beta emitting radioligand therapies and we're starting to bring on those alpha emitters. Um, those patients are, I think, going to need individualized uh, individualized uh, dosimetry and dosing to try to find the sweet spot between treating their cancer and not giving them completely intolerable toxicities. But uh, but yeah, it is uh, it is funny how this idea it, it it is always appealing and there are people doing really great work in it, but we don't seem to be able to quite translate it clinically. So I think it's a great question, but I, I don't have a don't have a great answer for it. All right, and then uh, uh, let's see another another question in the chat. Uh, how how often do you recommend follow up PSMA imaging, and when do you recommend it? So uh, I think that's another great question, and and we're probably more constrained in the U.S. than maybe a lot of other places around the world are, such as Europe and Australia. Right now, the uh, FDA hasn't labeled any of the FDA approved agents for any sort of follow up indication, and I think some of that is the uncertainty that exists. Uh, about how androgen access targeted agents affect PSMA expression and just the uh, the fact that there's conflicting data there's only small only small studies some of which are prospective but they're they're just tiny studies and they don't necessarily provide us the real information as to um, as to how those agents are affecting PSMA expression and what we can we, we can do with uh, with that information so I, uh, I admit I don't generally ever recommend uh, a follow-up PSMA PET uh, only because I, I, don't, I don't have the data to necessarily go and argue with an insurance company on the patient's behalf or tell my referring providers how to argue with the insurance company uh, about how to get that paid for. I think there's a great argument to be made that if you have a patient who has responded to whatever therapy even if they've had a PSMA PET before starting that therapy, that when they do fail and their PSA starts going up again, I think we absolutely need to be imaging those patients with PSMA. Uh, and I think insurers are coming around to that idea. So maybe the best answer I can provide is at a, uh, at a subsequent biochemical failure might be the time to pull a trigger on, on a repeat PSMA PET. Uh, but I, I do think it's incumbent upon the field to to sort of push for those trials that are going to support the idea that uh, that we can use this as a follow-up imaging modality. And I think it pains all of us to see that, at least in the clinical trial patients at our institution, it's like they get a PSMA PET, then they go enroll in a clinical trial, and then that clinical trial follows them with recess reads on CT and bone scan, knowing that we're missing like all of their disease and we're probably missing when they fail and where they failed and how we can intervene at that point. It's it's just such a shame that that we're that we're sort of using the scan in such a sort of limited one-time fashion. And I certainly hope we, we get around that, but uh, but we will need the data to do so. And, and unfortunately the data isn't isn't quite there yet. Awesome, Steve. I know we're over time, but again, I you know I, I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, it's it's like I said, so it's always enlightening. I'm, I'm actually very excited about everything that you talked about, and and I think as as we go forward, it'd be great to keep up collaboration so we can um, make sure that maybe we can be one of the testing grounds for some of your new technology. And and um and again, like I, you know, a wonderful wonderful talk. Are there is there any other questions from the audience? We'll we'll take them now. Otherwise, we'll let Dr. Rowe enjoy the rest of his evening. And and uh, you know, I hope to see you soon, Steve. Absolutely. No, thanks so much, Ash. Thanks everyone for your attention. Uh, always fun to talk about these things. Uh, great questions, and uh, yeah, really, really appreciate everyone's attention. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good night. All right. Thank you.